23 years on from its original PlayStation 1 release, we have Chrono Cross, the Radical Dreamers Edition Remaster, a package that revives one of the true gems of the PS1 era, now with upgraded visuals and extras. Today then, it's out on PS4, Xbox One systems, Switch and PC, and regardless of platform, it's a real pleasure to see one of Squaresoft's great JRPGs revived. That said, the Radical Dreamers edition here is not an entirely perfect package as we'll discuss. For a start, there's been some very stark changes to its remastered backdrops and also issues with frame rate performance even playing the PS4 app on a PS5. So does the remaster dig deep enough to give the definitive experience or is the best way to play Chrono Cross still on a CRT using original PlayStation hardware? To discuss, I've invited a good friend and of course colleague Audi Surly. How's it going? How is it going, Tom? This is actually our first video together. It is, yeah. And sadly though, for our first video, this might have been a radical dream for someone out there, but for us, that dream died on the way to the consoles. <laughs> Eloquently put, um, <laughs> I was going to go with a radical nightmare or something like that, but <laughs> maybe that's being a bit too harsh. Yeah, yeah, I think we just spoiled the entire review in the, the two minute mark. So I guess we can roll the credits around here. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> now, we should probably, though, uh, before going into even the remaster, you know, this was a very important game, right? Yeah, it was for personal reasons and also just in being, you know, for a Final Fantasy fan. This was the lost Final Fantasy game to me, and uh, it was uh, obviously never released in Europe had to import it at great expense and my god when you booted this game up you're greeted by this amazing Yasunori Mitsuda soundtrack gorgeous artwork you know this archipelago of islands was beautifully drawn um you know even presented on old ps1 hardware and you know this game unlike Final Fantasy I, I noticed had a real emphasis on different stuff like branching pathways a huge number of characters that you could collect along the way and you'd get multiple routes through the adventure which was something Final Fantasy rarely did uh, like getting into that Viper Manor at the start so it was doing a lot of different stuff I, I kind of feel like Square e or Squaresoft at the time right was kind of they had a tier system on the PlayStation 1 so tier 1 was Final Fantasy Final Fantasy Tactics these kinds of games but then you had like these you know bona fide cult classics like Chrono Cross, and I mean that is what Chrono Cross is. Yeah, it's a cult classic. It is not perhaps the most beloved of these original uh, PlayStation One RPGs from a legendary company in its own right. But for me, what's so interesting about Chrono Cross is the fact that of its generation, it's one of the ones that truly showcases the power of the PlayStation One in so many different ways than just polygonal. Uh, strengths, right? Yeah. Um, the music from Mitsuda-san, yeah, absolutely incredible, but also done entirely via samples. It was not, you know, recorded instruments, uh, which is incredible when you listen to the depth of that soundtrack. Uh, many people don't even know it still to this day as a sample-based soundtrack. And then when you look at something like the art and the consistency of the art, which is something we'll get back to, uh, when you look at this back then from a proper CRT and Phosphor, it's just incredible. It is, you know, art in motion. So for a PlayStation 1 game, this is among the finest on a technical level and in many ways also on a gameplay level. The mechanics are quite different from the usual Squaresoft uh, affair. Yeah. Well, it's been a, a long stretch between uh, then and now. 1999 was the original release date. And uh, this Radical Dreamers edition, the remaster, shall we dig into what it actually like adds to the package? Well, should we first look up what a remaster is in the dictionary? <laughs> oh <my> because God. <laughs> we will we will probably use that word for this review, remaster. Yeah. But I think in this case, and I'm sorry to go so directly uh, here on top, but it really needs to be said that, I mean, this in many ways is not a remaster. Mm, it's a touch-up, a very uh, elaborate touch-up in places, but yeah, I wouldn't have said this comes under the definition. Maybe a Square Enix definition, 
<laughs> they have their own dictionary. Yeah, like <laughs> um, they went this route with Final Fantasy VIII, didn't they? Like they called that a remaster. But, it, you know, in a very broad sense, it doesn't go quite far enough. So, yes, this, this remaster, let's call it. Well, we understand that the original team didn't work on this directly, though there were some contributions from certain key staff members, like uh, Masato Kato, uh, the writer, the original writer. There's new illustrations across the game, which is probably the most significant con contribution to this package. I think so. And think so. Uh, that's from Nobu Teru Yuki, and of course, composer Yasunori Mitsuda, legend that he is, did actually produce a couple of tracks for the opening kind of launch splash screen. Yeah, for the menus specifically. And this is interesting because I think this was kind of pointed out early in marketing that he would come back and do something. And no one really knew what this was going to be until that Nintendo Direct uh, a couple of months ago, remember? Yeah. And I mentioned then on a DF Direct that um, you know Mitsuda-san in Japan has been doing quite a lot of work with the Chrono Cross music. He has done a live performance uh, tour, which was just released on Blu-ray, which you can see some footage of here, and uh, even an arrangement album of Trigger and Cross music. So I mean, I was maybe expecting a bit more involvement from him, uh, but the arrangements that are here are absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I don't think they needed to be changed too much. So uh, to be clear, like no. in-game, the arrangements are unchanged completely. Uh, as far as I've played anyway, they are the same sort of sample-based PS1 sounds that we heard yes. back in 1999. And it's only the main menu that has some new fully orchestrated tracks and they sound incredible. So, you know, new music for the Splash, uh, redrawn character art, and also uh, backgrounds are AI upscaled. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. Where do we start on that? So the game does have the classic mode and the new mode, uh, when referring to the graphics. And I worked with AI upscaling in video games for a couple of years now, actually. Hmm. And the thing about AI upscaling is that uh, you really need to train the AI, right? It, this takes a long time, and it's quite specific work uh, if you want to do it properly. Mm. Uh, Square Enix, however, I don't think you want to do this properly. So it's very clear that they ran it through an AI upscaler that really weren't wasn't trained to handle the dithering and just a low resolution of these backgrounds. So this probably is the most contentious point. The team is clearly working from what appears to be like the original PS1 uh, pre-rendered backdrops and then AI upscaling a lot of the results. Um, so the original, like the um, the classic mode, gives you them raw, like pixelated, you know, much as we saw them on PS1. But this AI upscaling, it creates this kind of smudged watercolor look that doesn't really flatter the image always. It's kind of like, you know, in the classic mode, you've got these... Uh, low color depth uh, sort of dithering to like blue skies and everything and that works on a crt oh perfectly on a crt it blends everything together right yeah but it, here um when you take that image that raw image with the dithered skies and dithered colors in points and then apply an ai upscaler in this nature anyway it just smudges those dithered points and creates new details out of them in the sky yeah and it just looks like artifacting it's just it's so bizarre that they're pre being presented this way you can also see like across all these uh basic textures right these background textures yeah like there's this ripple effect which is very common when the ai is just as you're saying it's trying to integrate some sort of detail that's it thinks it's seeing yeah but what happens is that you get this kind of ripple effect and it's across everything and the thing about ai upscaling in general tom is that no matter what you're kind of upscaling unless it is fairly flat for example like a visual novel you have fairly high resolution sprites for example with flat color tones and that works really well but you still need to tinker with this by hand afterwards because you're gonna have loss of detail and it's clear here, if you look at signs and such, that like it 
just gets completely smudged out and they did not take that into account and it really ruins whatever effect they're trying to have. The thing about these backgrounds and you and I were looking at this before recording is that there are fan community mods for uh, emulation which have the very same technique applied but with much better results of course these are fans they can do you know they can train their AIs differently they can use different sources and I'm sure you know we, we have to take that into account uh, for with a commercial product but it just does show you though that the, these results could have been better even by 50 percent better but they are among the worst I think I've seen uh, in a commercial product uh, when it comes to AOPS going yeah I think the best I've seen, or among the best, was the Moguri mod on PC for Final Fantasy yeah. IX. That, that's always that like that seems to be the one. That appears to be the one, yeah, the the, the fan favorite. Um, but you know, there's plenty out there on Reddit as well. Uh, fans having a stab at their own, and you know, maybe you know, the silver lining is with the PC release, there might be this movement to try and uh, have uh, our own uh, attempt at this. So. Yeah, the the alternative, I would say, isn't great either. Playing on the classic mode, you're just left with these raw images. Some, you know, it's hard, hard to put a definitive resolution on them, but they're meant for 240p, 480p yeah. displays. So I think the world map is probably the worst part. And when you kind of get out of the, the opening village, <laughs> you can just see how pixelated all of this is. Now, the game... I will say, you know, all the 3D elements, everything 3D that you see in battles and the models running over the top of these 2D uh, backdrops, they all run at around 900p or 936p. So there's this mismatch between one part of the image and the other part, and it just creates this... I don't know, it's a, it's a bit of a tragedy. It's inconsistent across the board, and this is a bit of a shame right because like when you look at the classic mode and we have some footage here of like the battle scenes as you mentioned uh in classic mode these uh 3d models as you said they're still rendered they are the old models but they're being rendered a higher solution which creates this uh, gigantic mismatch with these also kind of smudged uh patterns here with the background so classic mode while in most cases will give you the raw output it's not always the case it's a hard one this how to present this uh, but i do think that in the classic mode they sh probably should have rendered out the game in its native resolution and then nearest neighbored it up yeah we had the same problem in uh final fantasy 8 as well it's just we did mention the models like they've upgraded the character models right yeah in new mode yes. in the new mode um to be honest, uh, the old models look fine as they are, but I actually quite like the new models as well. They they look sharp and clear. Uh, I think the problem we're getting at there is that regardless of which mode you use, they're always going to be presented at 900p. So Yeah, they're still much higher resolution and just uh, much more detailed than the backgrounds will ever be. Uh, because either the backgrounds are smudged by AI filter or they're just lower res. So... Uh, they never really fit in with their environments, but the new textures on the new models uh, do look pretty good. So uh, I will loop back and say, resolution-wise, PS4 and Switch were tested uh, by us, and they, they both run at the same settings, 900p to about 936p for all the 3D stuff. You get a 1080p uh, HUD, uh, uh, like overlay for you know, uh, the menus, but that 900p figure stays in place regardless of the mode you select. Uh, the only thing that changes in that respect is the text quality. The text for, you know, uh, battles gets downgraded in the original mode, so it looks a little bit rough, but, you know, that's that's just how it goes. Um, what did you make of the portrait redesigns? What do you think of those? I kind of like them too, uh, but again, it kind of comes down to this inconsistency that happens between them. The fonts and the menus, menu layouts in your mode aren't to my liking so much, but that's a nitpick on my end. I understand that. I think most people will probably prefer these new illustrations because they are beautiful. Uh, there's no denying it. It just create again. It, it goes into this whole mismatch thing 
uh, but you know the effort is there and I think that the illustrations alongside the music that has been rearranged are among the best uh, additions to this uh, Radical Dreamers edition. Absolutely agreed, yeah. Uh, another point like I, I did notice and I was kind of appreciative of this is the FMV, the uh, the, the classic FMV at the start of Chrono Cross with the uh, Scars of Time track by Mitsuda. That has actually been uh, improved. They uh, did something to just this one, I've noticed. I'm not sure if it's a, you know, like an archived high quality version or maybe just really smartly AI upscaled. I think what they did is actually uh, they AI upscaled it uh, with um probably a different AI or one meant for uh, maybe, maybe like Topaz or something. But I think they also interpolated some frames. Yeah, they denoised it for sure. Like the compression's gone completely or mostly. And they also added the, you know, that text that comes over the top. That's all high quality now. And uh, so, you know, opening out, this was actually quite a good, a decent first impression. I thought they'd done some work here, but when we get into the game, you click new game plus, you notice the FMVs then are just presented really raw and no AI upscale. Yeah, they're quite they're quite rough. Yeah, no like loads of compression and uh, something we'll get onto uh, in a moment. But the music behind these uh, FMVs, especially the Scars of Time track, are really compressed. Like it's they're very low quality. Yeah, I noticed that too. So my theory on this is that I, I think, if I remember correctly, I have the soundtrack CD. Uh, and of course, it has been rearranged, so it makes you wonder why they couldn't just have overlaid a new version of the track. Uh, but I think it's timed differently than the soundtrack version for the video. So I'm guessing that when making the game, they just felt like that they could reproduce the timing, perhaps, of Time Scarf with the video but that of course brings into question why didn't they just kind of get another rearrangement time to the video then uh, if they already had the involvement of mr mitsuda but of course this budget can be many things i just think that i noticed that too that like uh, it feels like there's like a little pass filter on these videos uh, on the audio and it it really sticks out Well, the good news, I guess, then, uh, we can loop back to music, but you, when you boot the game, the, the music is exactly as we'd remembered, and uh, Mitsuda's original score uh, like presents itself pretty much as it was, so I'm, I'm kind of pleased about that. Yeah, it is actually, uh, I did test that, though, uh, and it is a bit clearer on the Radical Dreamers edition, which I think comes down to something we'll go a little bit into in a few minutes here, but... Uh, the way the game is being ran uh, and, you know, uh, wrapped up for uh, PS4 and such. I think whatever software they're using is actually putting out the music at a higher bitrate, perhaps, with the samples. Uh, it is a little bit clear. It's it's very minuscule. Don't think of it as a kind of like, wow, a feature. <laughs> but uh, it is just simply the software they're using to uh, play the game. Uh, is putting out the music in a little bit more clearer fashion than the uh, PlayStation Sound chip did. Right, so shall we move on to the performance side of things? Oh, absolutely. Let's do it. Okay, there's no way to dress this up. Without a doubt, it's one of the worst performing games I've played on a PS4, or even a PS5 for that matter, which we're using here using the PS4 app. You know, Tom, a week ago, me and John Lemon of Digital Foundry, uh, we made a video about uh, Biomutant. In that video, I did coin a new term that I said was dynamic frame rate. Little did I know that a week later, Square Enix would make that a real feature of a game. That they have, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so the, I will say up front, the frame rate analysis on this game is a little bit tricky to handle because, um, as you can imagine, the gameplay runs at about 30 FPS for like traveling and battling. But then there are 60 FPS menus over the top, which kind of 
rumbles our tools a little bit and uh, so I'm being very selective about which clips I'm using. So with all that being said you can see in the uh, footage of PS5 and its new graphics mode the frame rate can really wildly fluctuate between targets like set limits like the baseline is the target is 30 fps and it gets there during you know basic travel around these maps but in battle especially you'll see it go down to 20 fps 15 fps and even hard capping at 10 fps at points especially when there's like a big spell or something so the first impression here was okay we're going for the fully authentic emulated uh, approach to how this game actually looked and ran back in the day but then I thought, okay, so let's compare this to the original PS1 version side by side in all these clips that actually track well with our tools. And the results were quite shocking. It turns out that actually this PS4 app version running on a PS5, hardware many generations ahead of the original PS1, actually runs Chrono Cross at a worse frame rate at points. So like a uh, very classic example we found at Audi is that this first hallway bit when you first gain control, you run it up and down and it runs at 20 FPS on PS5. And you know, this ran at a locked 30 on the original PS1 edition, well with some one-off drops. And it kind of recurs across all the clips that we've found. Essentially just about anything with some sort of 3D element entering the screen seems to hard cap the frame rate to a lower bounds more typically on the newer release with the new visuals instated. Now the only exception to this I've found is the title screen with the 3D background as it pans across this ocean bed. Uh, a PS5 actually has an advantage here as you'd kind of hope. But then most clips seem to genuinely favour PS1 overall in frame rate which is astounding. So yeah, as we're saying, this is probably one of the worst performing games I've ever seen on PS4. <laughs> or PS5. I mean, this is one of the first times I think I've seen a PS5 game for me drop till to 10 frames per second. Yeah, this is the first and hopefully last. But there is a twist to this though, in that um, we found that going to the menus of the Radical Dreamers edition and switching the mode to the classic visuals mode you actually get a better frame rate than with the new visuals. So in essence, you end up kind of with a similar-ish frame rate to the PS1 original. That is to say, not great, and it's still wavering pretty terribly, but at least it's on par, or if not, a little bit better. So there is that. Oh, and also there's the Switch version, which we tested as well. And between the two modes, you know, just testing that hallway bit, we can see it's got the exact same behaviors as uh, the PS4 app running on PS5. So there's really nothing lost on Switch. You've got the same frame rates as low as they are coming out in both modes. It's also worth saying added to that, that regardless of which version you play, there's also this weird stutter right at the end of every battle, just during the victory pose. It's not um, something that ever appeared on the original PS1 edition. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of added to this new version. All round though, I don't think you're really going to notice it too much amid the already pretty low frame rate. I mean, it's already chugging. It is a chugger. You know, that's a good way of putting it. And I think uh, our theory on this is that it's, you know, obviously this is emulated because or else it wouldn't be replicating the exact, you know, frame rates of the PlayStation 1 version. Uh, but I think uh, additionally, Square is using probably an Unreal wrapper or something for the emulator, which is creating these stutters on top. And also the injection script for these uh, new backgrounds is also creating some sort of overhead and then bringing the frame rate down by 10 to 15 at times, on a, even on a PS5, you know, it's just uh, absolutely insane. We talked about remasters, but this isn't necessarily remastered, it's an emulated version being put in this kind of wrapper environment uh, with a few quality of life fixes like fast forward and stuff but it is very much within like the emulation realm rather than the port uh, because with a port you would be able to do a lot more the thing is that like there are probably ways of overclocking the emulation to hit consistent 30 and 60 at the very least uh, between the areas uh, especially if you have an unreal wrapper or unity or such 
uh, you can probably put some pointers on the code in order to where to cap to this and where to cap to this. Yeah, it just kind of brings about this kind of awkward conversation of like, you know, these emulators that are out there, have been out there for years, can produce probably way better results on a number of devices that you have already. It, it doesn't look good when you have a game here from the actual developer and then it doesn't even have the minimum amount of fixes that could be implemented via emulation. Yeah, it's such a tragedy. I keep saying that word tragedy, but that's all I can think of. I, I guess uh, the, the question we're drawing ourselves to is, you know, which is the best way to play? You know, is this really the ideal way to play it? Because there's a lot of extras. Uh, at least in the menus, like you get the Radical Dreamers. Yeah, we didn't talk about that yet, but it does have the visual novel Radical Dreamers, which is for the first time officially uh, translated. You know, you mentioned the better version, Tom, and I think this this actually brought about something interesting for me because we did notice from some other tweets and whatnot before recording that like there was some assumed performance issues on the Switch, but this doesn't seem to be the case from our short testing. We only got it uh, today. The Switch version, but we played over an hour, almost two, uh, and didn't notice any. Every result we had was consistent with the PS4 version, so there was no difference. Uh, but what we did notice is that playing it in handheld mode uh, and then having the game rendered at 720p actually eliminates some of the uh, inconsistencies by rendering it at a higher resolution. You know, playing portably actually helps blend those 2D backdrops with the new models. And it's it, like having it at 720p in presentation anyway is just, yeah, actually works really well. It works to its benefit. And I never expected it to make such a stark difference as it does here. So weirdly enough, you know, given that we've established the performance is the same as PS4, you're not really missing out. And in fact, you're gaining uh, something by playing on Switch just by virtue of the fact the visuals look a bit more consistent. It's a it's a very strange thing, but um, yeah, I, I was actually quite uh, pleasantly surprised by playing on Switch. For us, you know, it, it is there is the question of having the original versions of the game. Would you want to go back to the original PS1 version and play on a CRT instead? Because, you know, I, I've been inspired uh, to go back to this game now and I'm thinking there's a good argument that it's worth going back just to have that original feel. So there's an argument for that, but I think what's much more important than that, actually, because I realized that by saying, oh, I would just go and play the original on original hardware, on my original, on my CRT, that's a very tough and tall ask for most people to get all these parts together to play one single game or this era of games. And I think the conversation actually needs to be more on, we need to change how we focus on presenting these remasters for this era of games. Uh, I think it's about time that developers, because this is peak nostalgia, you know, for you and for I, these games now, they, they mean a lot to us. Uh, because we were growing up at this time and we are a little bit older, but like the generation after us, you know, this stuff is what they grew up with as very young. So you can imagine that the effects that this is having on them to see them re-released. And it's very important for preservation and for, you know, people's, uh, you know, feelings towards these games. And I think much more important than saying, you know, get the CRT and play it on the PlayStation 1 with the original load times and such. I think what I would have loved to have seen on this and future PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2 era of games, Saturn, is to have like a new way of presenting them within like a CRT type shader environment, not just the filter of like scan lines, darkened scan lines across the screen, but actually emulating the, you know, the bloom and phosphor feel of a CRT and getting like some curvature in there. We've seen it on a few games uh, already. There are some developers doing it, but I think replicating the CRT feel within a shader environment, within these masks that you can apply at top of these games, uh, would actually be way more transformative than simply upscaling them via AI or rendering them at a higher resolution, which really just breaks the game and it breaks the illusion that they were creating within CRTs. If you have the console, if you have the game in the retro tank, definitely, uh, I would probably prefer playing the original just because of the consistency that I will get from that result. 
Uh, but I do think that for the conversation of these remasters, which are, you know, that's what people want. And that's how we can bring them to more people. But within that, even just the option, I understand a lot of people listening to this will probably just say that I would never use a CRT mask on my TV. I want it, you know, pristine and clear and all this stuff. And that's totally fine. But I do think the option should be there. Yeah, uh, for the sheer sake of convenience, I think that's what these remasters, remasters are all about. Fundamentally, I'm just glad that there's a, a way to play this game without pulling out a lot of the old tech that I have lying around. And that the conversation, uh, at least in a small part, uh, has moved back to Chrono Cross uh, within, you know, gaming circles. Like, they're, they're, the people are being reminded of this game and how fascinating it was, its premise, how melancholy the story is. and That's so interesting, you know, that melancholy. We, we're older now, right? We were saying before recording that, like, 40 minutes in, I am just so taken aback and enthralled with where this game is going because these are nuances there's an em there's an emotional undertone to the game that i didn't capture at like age 13 so playing it now in my late 30s it's quite the emotional tour and i was quite surprised by that i don't think it's pure nostalgia either it's just actual no. quality almost like twilight zone-esque ideas sort of putting a a very bittersweet spin on you know a, a situation you know the situation being transported to another world where nobody remembers you and in fact you've died many years earlier that's such a dark idea but they do a lot with it it's a real i don't know of any triple a game developer right now who's playing with those types of ideas in games yeah, yeah absolutely without it being too uh, on the nose with it you know the, the just nuance to the way they tell this story that really it, it makes you think rather than telling you what to think about it and i really yeah it it's an amazing experience just for the story alone so there's definitely merit to playing this again but uh, be forewarned that if you're looking for the best version of the game this ain't it no but yeah, the option is there now at least. And I'm, um, yeah, like I say, glad it exists in some form, but I do wish it was so much better. I look forward to the comments under this and uh, hearing what people think of the ports. And uh, yeah, I think we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for joining me, Audi. Anytime. And we'll do our usual wrap up here. If you did enjoy this video, feel free to like or subscribe and don't forget to hit that bell for instant notifications as any new video lands. And of course, we've got this video on our Patreon at digitalfoundry.net. You can get in touch with myself, Audi, and the rest of the team on Twitter. But from the both of us, thanks for watching.